Reprise de débat. Resuming debate. Honourable Member for St. John's. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to rise in this House today to speak to the motion put forward by the Honourable Member from Saint Leonard Saint Michel. With the holiday season almost upon us, our discussion today is very timely. The holidays are a time of year when people get together to celebrate with family and friends, but there is, of course, a cloud to that silver lining an increased likelihood of impaired driving incidents following the celebrations. A number of public education awareness campaigns are in full swing this time of year. They encourage Canadians to drive sober or offer drivers alternative ways to get home safely. One of them, as we've heard already, Mad Canada's Project Red Ribbon is marking its 30th anniversary this year. Together, these efforts have had a powerful and positive impact. According to Mad Canada's estimates, between 1982 and 2010, nearly 36,650 lives were saved in Canada due to the reductions in alcohol-related fatal crashes. That's something for which we can all be very thankful. But despite the progress we've made as a society, impaired driving remains a very serious problem in our country. People who are in no shape to drive continue to get behind the wheel. Some choose to drive after getting high or having too much to drink. But as this motion suggests, impaired driving is not limited to drugs or alcohol. Motorists who are too tired to drive are also impaired, and they can cause just as much damage as drivers who are drunk or high. The same can be said for distracted drivers, including those who text behind the wheel. Impaired drivers of all kinds not only put their own lives at risk, they endanger the lives of their passengers and everyone else around them. In fact, impaired driving remains the leading criminal cause of death in Canada. Antisocial criminal decisions leaving thousands of Canadians dead or seriously injured each year. And what makes this carnage on our roads all the more senseless, Madam Speaker, is how easily these deaths could have been prevented. The risks are well known. The risks have been known for decades. The risks are common sense. Today you'd be hard pressed to find someone who would deny the dangers of drunk driving Sadly, it is a somewhat different story when it comes to drugs. Drug-impaired driving is actually on the rise, Madam Speaker. Almost 3,100 incidents of drug-impaired driving were reported by police last year, 343 more than the previous year. Overall, the rate of drug-impaired driving increased by 11 percent. According to the Canadian Centre of Substance Use and Addiction, 40 percent of drivers who die in vehicle crashes test positive for drugs. By comparison, 33.3 per cent test positive for alcohol. Figures like these show how crucial it is to get the message out about the risks and consequences of impaired driving, including driving under the influence of cannabis. As you know, this past spring, the Government of Canada introduced Bill C-45. Its overarching goal is to protect the health and safety of Canadians, keep cannabis out of the hands of youth, and prevent criminals from profiting from its production and sale. The bill proposes tough new measures to severely punish anyone who sells or supplies cannabis to young Canadians. That includes two new criminal offences with maximum penalties of 14 years in prison for those who sell or provide cannabis to anyone under the age of 18. These proposed measures complement a public education and awareness campaign informing Canadians, especially Canadian youth, about cannabis and its risks. Budget 2017 directed an initial investment of $9.6 million for public education and awareness on this topic. The public education campaign has begun, Madam Speaker, and we will continue over the next five years because there is an immediate and continuing need to set the record straight on a number of issues related to cannabis. The funds will also be used to monitor the trends and perceptions of cannabis use among Canadians, especially our youth. Too many people are under the, under, are under the delusion that cannabis does no harm which is completely false. Cannabis presents definite health risks. Another myth centers on a person's ability to drive after consuming cannabis. We know that young people who test positive for drugs, alcohol, or both continue to be the largest group of drivers killed in motor vehicle crashes. But when it comes to cannabis, research shows that many Canadians, including youth, don't take the risk seriously. According to an ECO study conducted for Health Canada last year, 27% of Canadians have driven a vehicle while under the influence of cannabis. 
More than one-third of Canadians also reported that they had been a passenger in a vehicle driven by someone under the influence of cannabis. That number jumps to 42% among young adults and 70% among recent cannabis users. The results of a national study conducted by the Partnership for a Drug-Free Canada help explain these findings. It found that almost one-third of teens don't consider driving under the influence of cannabis to be as bad as alcohol. In addition, just over a quarter of Canadian young adults between the ages of 18 and 24 believe that a driver is either the same or, sadly, better on the road while under the influence of cannabis. The reality paints a far different picture and a more gruesome picture. Among all drivers killed in motor vehicle crashes in Canada between 2000 and 2010, 16.4 per cent tested positive for cannabis, one in six. Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, it is clear that a large percentage of Canadians downplay or even flat out disbelieve the fact that cannabis impairs your ability to drive safely. And that is one reason why Bill C-46 is such an important piece of legislation as a complement to Bill C-45. Bill C-46 would strengthen Canada's laws to enforce a strict approach for those who drive under the influence of alcohol or drugs, including cannabis. Among other provisions, it would create new criminal offences for drug-impaired driving and authorize new tools to allow police to detect drivers who have drugs in their system. In September, the government announced up to 240, sorry, excuse me, 274.5 million in funding to support the provisions of that bill. Up to 161 million of that fund is earmarked for building law enforcement capacity across the country. It will help law enforcement and border officials detect and deter drug-impaired driving and enforce the cannabis legislation and its regulations. That includes training additional frontline officers in how to recognize the signs and symptoms of drug-impaired driving and plotting with access to drug screening devices. It also includes funding to raise public awareness about the dangers of drug-impaired driving. As announced last month, the Government of Canada is joining forces with Young Drivers of Canada to spread that very important message. The project will involve the airing of public service announcements over the next year. Public Safety Canada and Young Drivers of Canada will also work together to share material through Facebook, Twitter and other social media. Madam Speaker, I think all of us in this House can agree that impaired driving is a serious problem in Canada. Awareness weeks like the one proposed by my colleague are another tool that we can use to foster good habits, recognize the dangers of impairment, recognize impairment itself because there seems to be some misconception on that. Have safer roads and save lives. I will be supporting this motion, and I encourage my colleagues in the House to do the same.